Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Open Mic VO. It's great to see you all here tonight. Um, this event on Sunday nights is about us getting together as a community to share stories and knowledge, to get and give advice, and to collaborate on problems that participants might pose to the group. We feature a different topic every week, and this week's topic is home studio equipment, home recording, software, microphones, acoustics. That's all on the table for tonight. This group on Sunday nights is about being positive and supportive of each other. Uh, there's going to be participants tonight at all different stages in their careers, but everyone here is a professional, and everyone deserves to be treated with the appropriate respect. Um, so to those of you who are new to the voice acting community, no such thing as a silly question. Go ahead and ask away. The rules are simple. Um, mute yourself if you're not actively participating in the conversation at that particular moment. I don't want to discourage you from, from participating, but if you're, not, uh, if you're not actively speaking, please use the little uh, microphone icon in the lower left-hand corner of your Zoom screen and just click it and that will mute you. Just click it again and you're unmuted. Be nice to each other, that's rule number two. And rule number three is we're recording and the recordings are posted to YouTube. So just keep that in mind. If, you, uh, if you're gonna be giving us any information tonight that might be proprietary or, or sensitive in nature, just remember that this does get posted to YouTube and I don't have any control over where the recording might end up from there. Um, I also want to apologize last week, for some reason, Zoom did not record the uh, session. So I'm hoping that tonight all rolls smoothly and that it does record properly. I wanna take a moment to thank voicesam.com for sponsoring tonight's Open Mic VO. Uh, Voicesam is a unique demo player that allows casting directors to zero in on very specific reads in your demo. Learn more at voicesam.com. And if you use promo code OPENMIC, O-P-E-N-M-I-C, all one word, uh, Bob Merkel, who's the president of Voicesam, will double the length of your free trial. That's promo code OPENMIC, and you'll get double the length of your free trial. Uh, before we dive into the whole topic of home recording, I have a question for you. And that is, are you finding open mic helpful? And the reason why I asked the question is that Edge Studio, which is where I uh, used to work and I used to moderate their talk time on Sunday nights at 9 p.m., they moved it to 5 p.m. Eastern uh, back in August or September of last year. And that was the whole reason why I started open mic to begin with was because I felt that uh, the 5 p.m. Eastern time that, uh, that Edge Studio had moved talk time to was really inconvenient for everybody. And uh, that's why I decided to start Open Mic. Uh, however, Edge Studio is moving talk time as of next week, I think, as, as far as I understand, back to the 9 p.m. time slot. So that means that Open Mic and talk time would both be live at the exact same time, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So I give you a few options. We could just continue with open mic VO on Sunday nights at 9 p.m., just like we've always done. Um, we could move the time. Perhaps we start at 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, that could be another option. And the third thing is, is open mic even necessary? Um, the whole reason why I started it was because talk time had moved from 9 p.m. to 5 p.m. If talk time's back at 9 p.m., then maybe open mic isn't, it's redundant. So why don't I uh, leave it to you guys? Please uh, let me know in the webinar chat box what you think. Should we just continue on at 9 p.m.? Should we move the time? Maybe we even move the day. Maybe we do it on Monday nights or Tuesday nights or something. Or uh, is it just redundant and we don't need it? Uh, we don't need it at all. 
I'll leave that up to you for your thoughts. Um, okay, enough about all of that. Tonight's topic is home studio technology. Let's get into it. Uh, once you see that I've unmuted you, please feel free to ask the first question or to offer the first story. Uh, and remember to mute yourself in the lower left-hand corner if you're not going to be speaking right away. So I'm going to start unmuting people now. Uh, once you see you're, uh, you are unmuted, if you want to ask the first question, go right ahead. Quite a few people here already tonight, so it'll just take me a second to get this started. So who wants to get us started tonight? Who's got the first question uh, about, who's got the first question about um, home studio technology, um, software uh, that you would like to get us started with? Or maybe I know that there's some people on the line here already tonight with a fair amount of experience when it comes to home studios. Uh, maybe you've heard about a really cool new piece of equipment that was just recently okay. announced that uh, that was just recently announced at uh, uh, NAM. So please uh, let us know. Graham, I have a question. Almost done unmuting people here. I have, I have a question. A hey, Paula, how are you tonight? Hi, I'm well. Um, my question is um, about uh, choosing your microphone, and I've heard a lot of conversation in the past about um, trying them out. But my question is, because I still don't really know a whole lot about, like, the brightness, what uh, people have mentioned, the brightness of some microphones over others and all, how, how do I know just from listening to various mics when I'm trying them out, how do I know which one is the best for me? How do I, how can I, any tips or things for me to listen for? Um, that's a good question. It's a question we get here quite often on, uh, on uh, open mic. And I'd like to throw it out to the crowd because I know that there's some good people here that uh, would have some good uh, guidance on that. Boy, everybody's shy tonight, and there's a, there's some people on here that I know are uh, pretty technically oriented. So, um, you know, he, my thoughts, Paula, on on microphones, especially when you're getting started, is that I think that we all stress far too much about which microphone is right for me. Um, one of the the best adages I've ever heard in the voiceover business is that a okay performance recorded on a fantastic microphone is always going to lose in an audition to a fantastic performance recorded on an okay microphone. Does that make any sense? Uh, it, most microphones now, uh, the technology hasn't really changed much in 60 or 70 years when it comes to uh, when it comes to microphones and the Japanese and Chinese have gotten the manufacturing of microphones down to an art where even an inexpensive $150 microphone or $200 microphone that you buy at Sweetwater or Guitar Center is going to sound to most clients virtually indistinguishable from the $3,500 Neumann German microphone uh, 
um, they, they really are that close. So, okay. um, you know, I, I think that there's a really? bunch of us, you know, who out there who stress over um, the fine, the fine, fine, fine distinctions between, well, you know, my voice on this microphone sounds different than my voice on that microphone. And do you know what? I think that if I sit and I very carefully A, B, you know, microphone A to microphone B, that I can nine times out of 10 pick out the difference. But if, you, if I just recorded myself on one of the microphones and just played the clip to myself randomly like an hour later, the chances of my being able to pick out the difference between, you know, one microphone over another is pretty limited. I'll bet you it's 50, 50, which is, you know, like flipping a coin. So okay. um, I, I really do think that the whole idea of, of, of being concerned about what microphone to pick should occupy less of your mental space around, you know, your, your beginning in your beginning, your start into voiceover than you know, which, who's going to be the right coach for you? That's probably a more relevant question than which is going to be the mic, right microphone for you. Okay. Thank you. That, um, I've thought about that a lot. And I, the mic that I'm currently using is by Blue. It's a Bluebird. And to my ear, I, I think I sound just fine with it. So, the, but I just was the, curious. The Bluebird is a fantastic microphone. I mean, it's not a, you know, cheap, you know, hundred buck microphone. It's, it's a lovely microphone. And I know, you know, I know professional voice actors who are, you know, out there cleaning up They're they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and they're doing it on like a $299 audio technica AT 4040 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the microphone, as long as it's recording you reasonably cleanly, um, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, I think you should be far more concerned about the acoustic space in which you're recording than you should be about whether you get a, um, uh, the blue bluebird versus the audio technica versus the, you know, you know, list another brand. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else is, wants to weigh in on that? I know there's some people here that are good tech people that, um, you know, usually can weigh in with a good, uh, a good opinion on this question. Hey, Graham, can you hear me? It's Trey. Hey, Trey, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And hey, this is for Paula. Uh, I think uh, staying with the original question itself, uh, sourcing uh, can be done by talking to, uh, I would, I would uh, suggest, uh, as you mentioned, uh, several of the major retailers in the country, um, my favorite, and I've got most of my equipment from SoundPure, Chuck Giardino with SoundPure. Uh, these guys have their own fully equipped music recording studios at home. These guys know gear inside out and backwards. And their company, SoundPure, and perhaps you can get this same service from Full Compass. I just purchased some, some things from them. And of course, you mentioned Guitar Center and um, uh, Sweetwater, but uh, the, the more boutique shops like Sound Pure uh, will send, first of all, give you advice on microphones in a budget range, whatever you want. And uh, with many uh, items they have, they will send out these units to you as demos. And you can pick and choose and send them all back or send two out of three back. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I've heard uh, SoundPure mentioned by, uh, by others, and their reputation is really strong. I don't know Chuck uh, Giardino um, personally. I, I haven't had any opportunity to deal with him, but uh, Trey, I'm glad to hear that your, uh, your interactions with him have been really positive to date and uh, happy to put the SoundPure information out there for people to check out. Uh, I put Chuck's name and the name of the company into the chat box 
And Stephen helped out by actually giving us the website address as well. So thank you for that, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, right. Who else has got a question for us tonight on technology? Um, recording software, recording equipment, microphones, acoustics, anything in that ballpark is more than welcome tonight. Yeah, I've got a question too. Hey, Trey. In addition to answers, <laughs> maybe. Uh, I'd like to know more about ribbon microphones for, you know, doing uh, VO work and, and podcasting and things like that. Uh, where do ribbon microphones fit into the scheme of <laughs> Who out there wants to weigh in on ribbon microphones? Who's had some experience with ribbon microphones and might want to uh, help us out with this? I don't want this to be all Graham all the time. So please, if you've got some experience with ribbon mics, it'd be great to hear it. Okay, then I will weigh in then. <laughs> um, ribbon microphones have a very distinct sound. <clears throat> and on some voices, they work really, really well. Um, however, there are a few distinct um, drawbacks to using ribbon microphones. First and foremost is the output from most ribbon microphones is exceedingly low. You need a very um, a preamp with a lot of available gain in order to successfully use a ribbon microphone. Um, there are some ribbon microphones now that rather than being passive, they're calling active ribbon microphones, but that means they have a preamp built into them and um, arguably they don't sound totally like the old authentic ribbon microphones. The second thing about ribbon microphones is, you know, it's, a, it's long and complicated and I won't get into the whole theory behind it, but by... The, just by the way they're built, they're all figure eight. They're, they all have a figure eight pickup pattern, which yeah. means that they pick up from the back of the microphone just as e any sound, just as easily as it picks up sound from the front of the microphone. It, it does a pretty good job of rejecting sound from the sides, but both the front and the back are equally sensitive. So if you've got a larger recording booth and you don't have to have the mic right up against a wall, then that's okay. But if you're working in a very small booth like I am here at, at, at my little home studio, um, a ribbon mic doesn't work for me because I, I have to have it literally up, you know, six inches from the booth sidewall and that's probably too close for a ribbon. <clears throat> Excuse me just for a second. <clears throat> The third thing about a ribbon microphone is that it does complement many voices really well, um, but it is rolled off on the top. Um, it, it, it's a soft sounding microphone and it's often used with, um, instruments are often recorded with microphones. In fact, ribbons are famous for recording saxophones for some reason, uh, just because the, the sonic, signature of a ribbon microphone complements the sound that comes out of a saxophone in that particular case. In, a, in many male voices, a ribbon microphone can be quite um, complementary. Uh, on many female voices, it can make them sound quite soft and thin. So that's another consideration. And the final drawback of ribbon microphones is that they're quite uh, fragile. They're quite sensitive. And, um, you know, they need to be stored upright. They, um, if it's a, a kind of an old school ribbon microphone, you cannot apply phantom power to it. Because if you did apply phantom power, it just fries the ribbon in there. And then it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars, if not more, to replace the ribbon. So, you know, they're, they're finicky. But there are some, there are some uh, voice actors out there that do use ribbons and use them successfully. Anybody else have any 
thoughts or any experience with ribbon microphones? Can I ask another question? Please do. Okay. I saw that uh, Neumann is going to begin production of the original U67. And, and some of these things have come and gone before my time, you know, of involvement uh, with using voice type mics. I used to be, you know, on stage in entertainment and we used, uh, you know, different types of microphones there. But, but this U67 it has all kinds of history and accolades and so on. But I'm not familiar with really how fantastic is it or will it be, do you think? The, the original Neumann U67 has yeah. been long revered by voice, well, by vocalists of all sorts, but by voice actors uh, especially. It's, um, if you can find one in great shape, they're typically selling between twelve dollars and $15,000 now. Um, that's how sought after original U67s are. In the 1980s, like 1984, 1985, I think it was. Maybe it was early 90s, but I think it was early 80s. Um, Neumann came out and re-released a very limited run of, of U67s because they were able to find enough of the original parts. And those original 60s, or those um, reissued 67s, um, also sold very, very quickly. There was a very limited number of them. I think like 100 of them or 150, something like that. Um, and those are highly sought after by, um, by recording studios out there as well. Um, if they are, I had not heard this news, but I'm not surprised because, you know, the, a couple of the big annual shows have just happened between CES and NAM. So I'm not surprised. They announced a couple of years ago that they were reissuing the U47 FET, uh, which was a, a, a version of their original U47 microphone. And that was reissued with a, a substantial degree of success. A reissue of the U67, man, it will, it will be a big deal when it, uh, when it hits the stores. I'm be curious to know if there's a price point associated with it. What, did they, su they suggest a price point, uh, Trey? I didn't see anything listed as, as a price, no. If it comes in anywhere under $5,000, it'll yeah. sell out instantly. It'll be a big, big deal. It's still going to be a very expensive microphone, though. Well, how will the character of it be any different from the uh, U87, uh, or, 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 or I'm sorry, the uh, 87 AI? The, well, the, the big difference is the U67 is a, uh, has a vacuum tube in it. It has an EF86 vacuum tube, which distinct, uh, it, it has a very distinct sonic character, which is different than the U87, which is a, uh, you know, a, a transistor based, right. um, transform, a trans, a transistor based microphone with a big transformer in it. And it has a very distinct sonic character of its own, which is often sought after by voice actors and, and people you know, recording music in recording studios. But the U67 has quite a substantially different sonic signature because of the addition of that EF86 tube. It's, it's a whole different thing. I'll be calling Chuck in the morning. <laughs> Well, Trey, once you find out how much the, uh, the retail price of the reissue is going to be, be sure and uh, send me an email and let me know. Uh, okay. Should I get a second one for you? <laughs> um, I don't have the spare five grand in my pocket right now, but uh, I'm sure uh, a U67 is something I would look at at some point in the future. Just making some notes here. Who else has got a question on, uh, on recording uh, software? Hi, Graham. Haley, how are you? Great. How are you tonight? Fantastic. I have Fantastic. a question. I'm very excited now that I hear the U67 is being reissued. 
Yeah, I'm thinking of a few people I'm going to be telling that about. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, curious about ISDN lines. Uh, I, I'm just wondering about the importance of having that as part of your voiceover business. It's not something I currently have. Uh, I'm not familiar with exactly how they work, uh, if it's a specialized installation process, uh, what the cost is, generally just the, uh, the, uh, the dummies approach to ISDN lines. Who online tonight has some experience with ISDN that they uh, might be willing to uh, impart to us? Hey, Graham, it's Larry. Hey, Larry Hudson, how are you tonight? I'm very well, you're looking very dapper tonight. Well, thank you very much, sir. So I'd love to address her question because I was in that dilemma. And, and here's the sort of the bottom line about it all. And that is that obviously ISDN is a 30 plus year old technology that's you know, just hard to die. And yes, there are lots of uh, production houses, recording studios that want, you know, that demand that we have ISDN. But my fix for it was, I know that it's going to go away. So I didn't want to go spend, you know, what, $1,500 plus for the codec box, plus whatever it would cost to get two telephone lines in here. And then I call Verizon and they don't know what I'm talking about. So what I did is I... Um, I have Source Connect, and with Source Connect or IPDiddle, IPDTL, either one of those internet-based, basically ISDN-type connections, you can bridge to ISDN, because I've found in the last two years, I've done one ISDN session, and probably 30 Source Connect sessions. So for me, it was a simple matter of spending the money to buy Source Connect, and when I need to bridge it, it costs me like 15 bucks, and it's not a big deal. So my personal thought on this is to buy ISDN, unless you're using ISDN at least once a day, every day, five days a week, it isn't, it's just too cost prohibitive and there's easier as good workarounds by using Source Connect or IPDiddle and using a bridge. So Haley, because you asked for the, um, the simplest possible version, I'm just gonna clarify a couple of things that Larry, that Larry just said. And Larry, thank you for that. Um, first of all, ISDN is a hardware based solution you have a box in your studio at your place. There is a similar box in the studio that you're patching into. And you use, as Larry said, this 30 year old crappy, uh, plain old telephone line technology to have one box connected to the other. It, it's a very, it's an antiquated, uh, technology that the phone company hates and everyone wishes would just go away. But as Larry said, it does, may, it does continue to be a staple in a lot of studios across America and it's stubborn. It's, it's dying, but it's dying a very slow death. Kind of reminds me of the night in the Monty Python movie. It's like, well, I lost an arm. I lost another arm. I lost, I can still fight. Um, it, it's kind of like that. Um, Larry mentioned a couple of technologies. One was called Source Connect. That's source hyphen connect. And you can find it at source hyphen elements.com. Um, it's a software based solution. It doesn't have a proprietary hardware box. It uses internet technology and it doesn't require an investment in a hardware codec, as it's called, sitting in your studio, or it, it doesn't require a, hard, a hardware codec sitting at the studio at the other end either. Um, and acceptance of Source Connect, IPDTL, and other 
internet-based solutions is getting better, but there are still many studios that are adamant about ISDN. And that's where Larry described uh, bridging comes in. What bridging re uh, entails is you using your source connect technology, you call this third party company that has a bunch of source connect boxes or, or source connect lines coming in and a bunch of ISDN codec boxes. And basically all you're doing is you are phoning into the ISDN codec and then you're being connected via this third party ISDN hardware box. Works really well. Um, as Larry said, you, you, you pay for it on a per minute basis. It's really quite reasonable in cost and it doesn't require you to invest in a 30 year old technology. So um, that's, that's a little bit more basic version of what it was that Larry just said. Sorry, I'm just checking to see if there are some questions in the chat box. Um, of course, I'm still very interested in getting feedback from all of you with regards to, um, as I mentioned, Edge Studio is moving uh, their talk time back to 9 p.m. on Sunday nights. And the whole reason I started Open Mic VO originally was because I thought that Edge Studio moving talk time to 5 p.m. Eastern wasn't really very convenient for anybody. And that's why I created open mic because I thought that there was a need for it. So my question to you all is, and please give me feedback in the chat box. Do we continue running open mic at 9 p.m. On, on Sunday evenings? Do we maybe switch the time to 8 p.m.? Another option is that we do it on Tuesday nights or you know, Thursday nights or something instead. And then the final option is, do we need open mic VO at all if Edge Studio has moved talk time back to 9 p.m.? Does there need to be two competing products? Because I'm, you know, there's, there's I, I don't have any, I've done this as a service to the community and I, and I love it, don't get me wrong, but if it doesn't need to happen, then there's, I, I won't make it happen. So please give me your feedback in the chat box. Uh, I'd like to remind you that Open Mic VO is brought to you by our friends at voicesam.com. You may not realize this, but buyers may be giving up on hearing your complete demos, and here's why. First, voiceover demos, of course, contain multiple tracks, multiple segments. But a traditional player, like a, an audio player in a, on a website, plays them back as one continuous track. See the problem? Today's buyers demand flexibility. They want to easily skip ahead or go back and replay tracks in your demos. But because the traditional player doesn't allow this, they simply give up listening. I kind of equate it to the old days of cassette tapes. You couldn't like, you could fast forward to, to listen to the next song, but you never quite knew where it was and it took several seconds to do so. As compared to CD players, you just kept pressing the forward button and you moved on to the next track. Well, that's kind of what Voice Sam's like. Voice Sam's patented demo player, instead of just listening to your demos, your buyers can now engage with them, playing and replaying the tracks that they want to hear. And that's because the Voice Sam player was designed with a buyer's workflow in mind. They naturally hear all the tracks in your demos right up to the last ones, and that means more bookings for you. Plus, with Voice Sam's easy to follow tutorials, you can have a professional demo player up and running on your website in minutes. When you add new spots, the VoiceAm player automatically updates itself on your website. So there's no remixing, you don't need to be a web guru, you've just saved a ton of time and a ton of money. And only VoiceAm offers you up-to-date analytics on listener behavior. You can see exactly who listened, from where they listened from, for how long, and much more is available through the analytics uh, dashboard as well. So check out VoiceAm at voiceam.com. 
It's the only audio player designed from the ground up for voiceover professionals. Don't forget to use the open mic promo code when you sign up. Use the promo code. Oh, Bob has changed the promo code on me. It's not open mic anymore. It's now O-M-V-O. O-M-V-O. When you sign up for VoiceSam, promo code O-M-V-O at VoiceSam.com and Bob will double the length of your free trial. Okay. Questions. Who's got questions? I've got another question on uh, ISDN, if you don't mind, Graham. Hey, Craig. Yeah, following on from uh, what Larry said, um, I just did an audition and uh, through my agent, and they said they have to have ISDN. Uh, I can't get ISDN where I live. So I was looking at IPDTL. How easy is it to, uh, if I just went ahead and got the one month plan, whether it's Source Connect or IBTTL, how easy it to, is it to set up for the first time and use? It's Larry. seamless. It's seamless. If you're, if you're ID, you can even buy a one day pass of Ipdiddle for 15 bucks, I think it is, something like that. <clears throat> and um, all you do is you're, you're, literally, you could pull this off in a half hour. Like, you know, you got notice now, they want you in 30 minutes. You could easily be ready to roll in 30 minutes. So does it seamlessly tie in with your uh, door? Yeah. Uh, did you just type well, in the, the ISDN run, number? Yeah, if diddle runs on, yeah, you just have the other person's ISDN number. You would give that to the bridge consultant as part of what you get set up. And then you basically, you're calling from if diddle into them, and then they bridge it through their, through their um, ISDN codec box and go straight to the studio. Sounds easy. It, Think it of is. it almost as you're doing Zoom today. <laughs> yeah, it, you're, you're absolutely right, sir. And, you know, listen, just I, I've helped a lot of people like they're freaking out and they, have, they, they didn't have Source Connect, but they were advertising that they auditioned for something that they needed Source Connect. And literally they got called at 8 o'clock in the morning. I had somebody on, you know, like at 9 o'clock. You know, literally, that's how quickly you can sign up, get it rolling. Because it's just software. You're just down, you're installing a program. On Ipdiddle, you don't even do that. It just runs on Chrome. The only thing you have to have installed on your Chrome, on your computer is a Chrome browser. That's it. Yeah. yeah Ipdiddle comes from the UK originally, from a BBC engineer, I believe. And um, Source Connect, you know, but they're all internet protocol, so it's just... As easy as what we're doing now with this conversation, pretty much. Yeah, there are actually three different versions of Source Connect. Two of them actually involve you installing a Source Connect application in, uh, on your computer. And there are some advantages to using the standalone application. There's plugins that you can use in Pro Tools, etc., so that uh, Source Connect is feeding directly out of Pro Tools. So if you wanted to do some processing in Pro Tools before sending your signal out across the line through Source Connect, you can do so. So there's Source Connect Pro, there's Source Connect Standard. Those are the two you know, installed versions of Source Connect. And then Source Connect has a product similar to IPDTL's product which is a web browser based uh, web browser based product. It just uses the codec that's built into Chrome and, uh, and provides a very intuitive, you know, browser interface over top of that. Um, so both source, excuse me, I'm dry throat today. Source connect now, I think is their version of it. And, and it's free. IPDTL. And it's free. Source Connect now is free. You can't beat that. <laughs> Have you any words, Larry? You, I, well, here's a great story. So I, there was another person in, in my associates that bought Source Connect. I think she spent, you know, Source Connect Standard, which is 650 bucks one time. That's it. And... Um, and she was trying to connect and they, they you know, they, it was, something was messed up and all of a sudden something popped up. When I saw everything that she did, she wound up doing the whole session on Source Connect now, but she didn't know. 
because <laughs> the guy called in and she answered and then they just went and did it and they actually did it on Source Connect because she had both on her computer and she didn't know where he was calling her from. So, you know, that there, there goes to show you, you know, you could even not spend the money. But see, most studios, if they're moving from an ISDN going to a Source Connect, they're using one of the top two tiers. They probably may or may not have Source Connect now. I mean, again, because Source Connect now is free. So, but it does work pretty well. I mean, yeah, yeah I've used you know, Source Connect now. Is. I've used Source Connect now, but uh, that one can't connect with an ISDN line, though. As far exactly. As you can't bridge Source Connect now to ISDN. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah. You can bridge IPDTL to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so clearly IPDTL, I mean, Source Connect now, uh, Source Connect, the standard version, the installed software version, I think is $695 for the base version. And it's like $1,500 for the pro version. Uh, so, you, but it's a one-time fee and versus IPDTL, which is some sort of, very modest monthly subscription fee. And, you know, certainly the feature set in the Source Connect installed products is richer than IPDTL, but for 99% of the voice actors out there just doing simple one track mono uh, tracking to a single studio in, you know, a, a city 100 miles from them, um, it works just fine. And just so, just as an add-on to that, if we're talking numbers, one of the the only thing that you would have to buy for a Source Connect product to, is is if you choose to, I think it's like a hundred bucks a year for su full time support. Right. And that's the only excess cost that you might incur if you should so choose. I should mention that their support is incredible. Like. I have reached out to them at eight o'clock at night at seven o'clock in the morning. They're based all over the world. Like one of them's in England, another one's in South Africa, another one's in Australia. And somehow they seem to have almost 24 seven support, which is, they don't guarantee that, but I got to hand it to them. Their support is incredible. Uh, Steven Gonzalez just passed along source connect standard is $650 US Source Live Pro or Source Connect Pro, sorry, is $1,495. So um, I wasn't too far off on the pricing. And then Source Connect Now is free. So, uh, and IPDTL, does anyone have a, uh, does anyone can do some quick research for me and let's figure out how much the IPDTL is on a monthly subscription basis? While we're waiting for someone to, to figure that out, I'm sure Stephen will come through for me. Um, here's a question, and, and Larry, you know, maybe this is a good one. Maybe this is a good one for you. Um, it, this is coming from Michael, and he's asking, so does phone patch mean ISDL or IPDTL or Source Connect or Skype? Like, like what's the difference between Source Connect and and ISDN and technologies like a phone like a phone patch, which is you know as simple as it sounds. Do you want me to answer? I'm happy to. So so bottom line is again we're using a word that is really um un, like saying uh, frigidaire instead of refrigerator. It's the name of a brand. You know, it's sort of like a phone patch because it used to be back in the day, if a client was, you know, in another city and they wanted to listen in on the, on the recording session at a recording studio, they had this box that was basically like a telephone that they could patch into the board so that the people could listen. But the quality really is quite inferior just as it is if you notice when you're talking on Skype, what it sounds like and what it sounds like when you talk on the telephone, there's a, a quality difference. So 
really we don't use, I don't know anybody any longer that uses really a phone patch, but what we now have as the replacement for that old technology is Skype. And Skype is, it's, it's all seamless. If you have a computer that's connected to an interface with a microphone in it, all you have to do is have the settings on Skype match the settings of where you're recording. The difference is with a phone patch, they only get to listen in. So what you're going to be doing on your end as a voice actor is you're recording on your end as well as sending out the same signal that's going to your recorder is going out through Skype so they can hear you better. Now, where people get confused is <clears throat> there, there is this possibility that there is someone on the planet that is um, uh, um, resistant to having a Skype ID, and that's fine, but you could actually go spend, you can, you can put money on your Skype account, like 10 bucks, and I think it costs something like two cents a minute to call within the United States and possibly Canada. And what you do is you, if you have credit, you can actually dial their telephone from your Skype. I sit, on my, I sit here at my desk and everything's integrated. I don't call on my phone. I call people on Skype because it's just easier because I already have my, my, my earbuds in and my microphone's live. And, and I'm talking to them on their phone from my Skype. And so that's easily done. And quite candidly, I think... I've never actually had to do that. Everyone that has ever said, we want to do a, a directed session or a quote, I need you to have phone patch. They do want to do it by Skype. The, what we were talking about earlier with the Source Connect, IPTIDL, ISDN, that is a, a technology so that the people on the other end can record you. A phone patch is just so they can listen in and you're recording the, the, making the recording on your end. And then you would obviously either send them the raw file or edit it as requested and then send it to them in your normal format. And that's really all a phone patch is. But Skype, now they don't even call it. What I don't hear, any, I don't hear phone patch anymore. What I hear now is I need to do a Skype directed session. And that's what I call it. So, Yeah, the important distinction there that, that people, it's important that you recognize is that um, having them dial in in some manner, whether it's via Skype, whether it's via, you know, an old fashioned telephone, however it is to direct you and you are still recording locally, that's a phone patch or what's called a, a, a phone patch um, versus, uh, oh, by the way, isn't this great? This is a, a little uh, premium item that got sent to me by a voice actor by the name of Bill Lord. Bill's an awesome guy. And Pull it back just a little bit. We can't see the words on it. It, it says, uh, nothing rhymes with Orange Studio, which is the name of Bill's, uh, Bill's um business and he did these little oranges which uh, stress balls i think they're awesome anyway um so foam patch means that um they are phoning in and directing you but you're still recording locally versus isdn or source connect where all you need to worry about at your end is just speaking into your microphone delivering a great performance and making sure that the signal's going out over your lines correctly because you don't have to record at your end. The recording's being done at the other studio, wherever that may be. So that's kind of the difference between a, a foam patch and like a, a more comprehensive ISDN or Source Connect session. Okay, uh, who else has got a question for us tonight on, on recording technology? There's 40 of us online. Everyone's being so shy. You also always have the option, of course, of typing questions into the Q&A box. Uh, that is, um, if you just hover your, uh, hover your um, cursor over top of the Zoom meeting uh, window, the, at the bottom, 
a, a bunch of icons pop up and you, um, the Q and A one is in the center. Linda's asking, how do I know if my acoustics are right? I have a great studio and by uh, Linda, I assume when you say by, I have a great studio, you mean you've invested in equi in good equipment and stuff. Oh, she has a whisper room. She says, okay. Um, added some acoustic foam, but how do I know whether it's the right amount of acoustic foam, whether it's right, the right placement, how do I know whether my acoustics sound good or not? And that's a good question. Um, my answer would be ask a professional <laughs> and I would refer you to George Whittem. Um, George Whittem, you can find at uh, George the dot tech or George the tech dot com. Either one of those uh, websites will will reach him. Um, he will have a listen to you. you. You send him a file. He defines exactly what you should include in the file and he, you send it to him and he charges a nominal amount. I, I think it's under a hundred dollars and he will get back to you with specific, um, specific thoughts, specific recommendations on the acoustics of your particular setup. Uh, yeah, Craig says contact George. Uh, Paula says uh, Dan Leonard. Uh, Dan Leonard is George's partner in crime on VOBS or Voice Over Body Shop, which is their uh, free streamed uh, vlog that they produce every Monday night. Uh, and Dan has a good set of ears and he could help you out as well. And you can reach either one of them through the um, VOBS.TV uh, website. VOBS as in voiceoverbodyshop.tv. Sorry, just continuing to make notes here. Uh, by the way, there's been a lot of chatter in the chat box about my dilemma as to whether to continue with uh, Open Mic VO and whether we should shift times and whatever. I am starting to think based on your input, and thank you all so much for, for your thoughts on this. I'm starting to think that we'll keep Open Mic uh, running for the foreseeable future. We're going to keep it on Sunday nights and I'm going to shift it to 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific. And we'll try that for a little while and see if, uh, uh, if that works. Because again, I don't want to um, interfere with the success of Edge and Talk Time. Uh, talk Time has been, you know, a staple in the voiceover community for seven or eight years now. And I do, wish the, I do wish the best of success to Edge with talk time. So rather than competing head to head, let's uh, move uh, open mic VO to 8 p.m. and we'll see what goes from there. I've got another question if nobody's going to ask, Graham. Please, go ahead, Craig. I've got a Rode NT1 going through a Focusrite Scarlet 2i2. Um, I see a lot of people like preamps and other stuff. I like the way this sounds. What benefits would adding a preamp or uh, uh, other parts, hardware to my chain, uh, would it make a noticeable difference? Well, to be fair, you do have a preamp. It's built into your Scarlet. Yeah. And, uh, and Focusrite, is world renowned for making fantastic preamps. So if you already have a sound that you like, I wouldn't, I mean, the NT one's a great microphone to, in my, in my humble opinion, it's a far better microphone than the AT one a NT one a. Um, and I think that, uh, if you've got a system that works, why mess with it? And the other thing is, 
why incur more costs when you don't have to, if that is money that you can be using on marketing yourself or getting more coaching, that's what I would suggest. I agree. And that's what I'm doing. But, uh, you know, I've heard a lot about people putting tubes on the front end and uh, to soften it a little bit. Obviously, I just don't know how much difference that actually makes for the cost that's involved. Um, I mean, for you to buy a tube preamp that would improve your sound rather than, than degrade your sound, because there are a lot of cheap tube preamps out there for like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks, but it will make you sound worse, not better. I mean, an entry level tube preamp is going to be, you know, six or $700 or more. I'm trying to remember what the uh, universal audio solo 610, I think is probably one of the least expensive tube preamps I'd recommend. And I think it's almost a thousand dollars now. Um, to buy if you buy it new. So uh, I, I think that you are in great shape just as you are. If you're happy with the sound of the NT1 going into the existing Scarlet preamps, I'd, I'd, I'd keep it as it was. Uh, Cynthia asks, I have a good amount of insulation and noise dampening in my recording space. But if a large truck or lawnmower or snowblower starts up, uh, she can hear it in her sessions. Is it appropriate to ask a client to hold on for a second or to schedule a quiet time of the night to call and record? Um, how do you go about managing your client's expectations when it comes to doing uh, live directed records? And that's a great question. Who's got some thoughts on that? Hi, Graham. This is Stephen. How you doing? Hey, Stephen. It's so good uh, to have you on tonight. You too. You too. Nice flat cap. Love it. The um, I I live in South Louisiana, so lawnmowers are a way of life here. And um, unfortunately, the best way that I've kind of experienced it is just to let the client experience it also. Um, we can't control when our neighbor is going to be cutting the grass or whatever. And um, when the client hears that background noise, um, you know, you're not going to be, most, most voice talent won't be in, in you know, channeled, decoupled uh, sound booths. And we'll do as much as we can as far as, you know, mitigating the internal sound. But once those lower frequencies come into play, generally they kind of make the, uh, initi take the initiative and say, why don't we wait, you know, until X time and, you know, I'll look and if I'm available, then I'll say, sure, you know. And maybe that's what needs to happen. Yeah, I think that clients can't have their cake and eat it too. And here's what I mean by that. If a client had wanted pretty much anything recorded 20 years ago, they were going to have to pay a voice actor to go to a professional recording studio and have it recorded. There wasn't any such thing as a home recording studio really back then. Well, now all of a sudden, the client has an expectation that they don't have to pay for recording studios anymore. Their expe expectation is that we all have built our own recording studios just as the cost of entry of becoming a voice actor. So as far as I'm concerned, they have to be willing to accept the occasional, hey, can you hang on just for a second while that, you know, Airbus A380 goes over top of my house. Um, I think that that really is just kind of, in my experience, I have never come across a client who gave me a hard time if I said, hey, can we take that tape again? Or can we take that again? Because I, I think that there might've been a ru some rumble from an airplane in, in, the, uh, in the recording. I've never had a client give me a hard time about it. Sure. They haven't given me a hard time either about it. And I mean, they want to be, we, we want them as, to be as successful as possible. They want us to be as successful as possible. So it's a team effort. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Well, we're up on 10 o'clock. So with that comment, we're going to wind it up. Um, thank you again to Voice Sam for sponsoring the show tonight. Um, remember to use the promo code OMVO. OMVO. And uh, if you use that promo code at sign up, uh, Voice Sam will double the length of your free trial period. So until next Sunday, and remember, as of next Sunday, we're going to be starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, so until next Sunday, 8 p.m., work hard, audition a ton, get lots of work. Good night, everybody. Good night, Graham.